I love ringing that bell. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. There's just a few more coming in, but we'll make a start anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Geological Society of London and to this, the Society's eighth London Lecture of 2017. Uh, the titles, Fault Growth and Interactions, Implications for Earthquake Hazard and Risk Assessment. My name is David Shilston. I'm the past, one of the past presidents of the Society, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor John Walsh. Faults are complicated systems. Their components vary in their complexity, from single faults through to those that comprise many interacting faults. Their interactions often show systematic growth patterns on geological time scales, but they become increasingly more complex at shorter time scales, say of a thousand years or less. Understanding these dynamics and the way that fault growth influences earthquake risks is crucial to understanding the earthquake hazard and information for the public. Because dangerous active faults may not manifest themselves in the landscape. Using case studies from New Zealand, Professor Walsh will consider some of the challenges associated with assessing earthquake risk and the need for a combined geological and geophysical approach, even in tectonically active areas where faults have not been previously identified. John Walsh is Professor of Structural Geology at University College in Dublin and Director of the newly formed Irish Centre for Research in Applied Geosciences. He founded the Fault Analysis Group with Juan Watson at the Department of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of Liverpool in, in uh, 1985 and became Director in 1996, overseeing its relocation to University College Dublin in 2000 and acting as Co-Director since 2005. John is also a member of the Geosciences Committee of the Royal Irish Academy and a past board member of the Institute of Geologists of Ireland. He's published over 140 papers in international journals and specialist publications and is an honorary fellow here at the Geological Society. We awarded him our William Smith Medal this year. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor John Walsh. Thanks very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here to be able to talk to you about my pet subject, which has kept me busy for the last 30 years. Um, I'm going to be talking about faults, uh, and I'm going to talk about how they grow. I'm going to start off on geological timescales, which people will probably think about as being maybe tens of thousands of years, or maybe even hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years. And I'm going to examine how it is that faults grow on those sorts of timescales, because I think they inform us a great deal about how perhaps the self-same faults actually behave on shorter timescales down to even earthquakes, which of course are um, uh, historical um, activities. And, and so I'll actually go and migrate from what would be considered to be geological ground through to paleoseismological ground and geophysics. And um, the work that I'm going to be talking about uh, is mainly work which has been published by our group um, because I know that work best. Um, and uh, Andy Nicholl is one of our main collaborators. He's in the University of Canterbury in Christchurch. Uh, but I'll also be talking about work which has been presented and published and in the public domain by uh, GNS Science, who do fantastic work on earthquake studies in New Zealand, because I'm, I'm going to be migrating towards New Zealand as this talk progresses. And uh, also NIWA, which work offshore uh, in New Zealand. So I think there is an increasing number of people who would share the same views as we have on faults and how they uh, develop. Um, so this is a, a sort of one of the aims or the aims of the talk. Uh, you see, this is a seismic volume in which we've m actually modeled and identified faults. It's a, a number of kilometers wide and a few tens of kilometers long. And um, you can see there's not just one fault. The faults are actually identified in dark here. There are actually many such faults, and this is a recurring feature of all fault systems, of course, that there are many different components in it. And I'm going to talk about those components and, in particular, the interaction between those different fault elements. Uh, and that gives us something uh, really very interesting to be investigating, um, both on the long time scales, in which I'll suggest that things are really quite ordered 
and uh, well behaved. Uh, through to the short time scales where perhaps things are a little bit more complicated for reasons that I'll mention uh, later. And then I'll finish up with uh, a number of slides in which I'm talking about, in particular New Zealand, because that's a place I know quite well. And um, I'll show you some pictures of, of the more recent activity uh, in, in New Zealand. So I'll be doing, using examples from New Zealand and Australia a little bit later. I'll, I'll dip into uh, the occasional sort of British and Irish example just to keep our feet on the ground. And uh, so this is a fault. It looks like one fault. It looks like a fault in isolation, if there ever is such a thing. Um, this fault uh, dies out along its length, and it's dying out this direction. It's got a maximum displacement of two and a half metres. It looks for all the world like the ideal fault. It's a fault which dies out along its length, and I've never known another fault that didn't do that, or at least didn't abut against another fault, or die out along its length. So if faults don't die out, then the world will fall in half. Of course, so they do. And um, those sorts of dying out of displacements is a measure of the way in which faults are interacting, the way they're behaving together. And uh, I'll try and impress on you that in the same way as that some people's minds and their minds on their own are very interesting, uh, when you actually look at populations and how they interact and how they perform, it's a, a great deal more complicated and really very interesting too. And that's what faults have to offer. Of course, faults don't occur in isolation. This is a picture which suggests they are in Iceland. And most of the examples I'm going to start off are uh, parts of the crust where it's in extension. Yeah? So it's only in the last uh, uh, couple of examples of case studies of recent activity that I'll actually start talking about other types of faults. These are so-called normal faults produced in extension, in this case in Iceland. Yeah? Uh, these are normal faults on a slightly grander scale uh, from the East African Rift. This is Lake Begoria in Kenya. Uh, this fault uh, has a displacement in the kilometre scale. And uh, this lake is one of the lakes where you will have, be familiar with uh, flamingos walking around in them. This is one of those lakes. And uh, this big fault here dies out in displacement laterally. Um, but within its downthrown block or so-called hanging wall, you can see that there are lots of little faults all dying out and and uh, communicating and transferring displacement between them. So, you know, it's very hard to get a fault in isolation without getting lots of many other faults. And it's, it's this population notion and the fact that faults are interacting, which I'm going to be exploring in these talks. Of course, as that fault dies out, we know the East African Rift doesn't die out. The East African Rift starts in the very north um, of uh, Africa, northeast Africa, and it uh, goes nearly along the entire length of eastern Africa. It has a displacement and a stretch across it which gradually decreases over hundreds, if not thousands, of kilometres. But when you look in detail at that particular fault system, you find, God, it's much more interesting than just one fault. I mean, if, if rifts only developed one fault, then I would have been a member of the fault analysis group. There would only just be one fault. Now, luckily, it's much more complicated than that, much more interesting than that. As this fault dies out, it actually transfers onto another fault, which is outside of this area. As this fault dies out, it transfers onto another fault here. There's a lot of transfer of displacement. This is communication. This is interactions. Yeah? And I'm going to be exploring those. We don't have to go too far away because uh, rifts that uh, tried to develop through Britain and Ireland um, uh, in the Upper Jurassic. And uh, here are some rifts, these old rifts developing, which uh, basically the Atlantic tried to, to move Britain and Ireland over to be states or additional states in the US. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> I've never said that before. But anyway, you know what I mean. So uh, here's, here's one of these stretches, one of these basins and rifts. It, there's not a great deal of stretching here, but if you take a cross section across it, you can see it's still obviously measurable. Um, here in orange is the crust beforehand. These are sediments deposited above it. But as you stretch, can you see that the, the crust thins here and it's thicker here? So we're effectively stretching the crust. It's thinning. In the upper parts of the crust, which is quite brittle. We get all these faults, these normal faults, producing stretching of the crust. And deeper down, they probably go into something really quite soft, ductile, and plastic as the temperatures increase. And these faults extend into this stretching crust. 
It's a multiple component system. And yet, what's really interesting is that if we go from here in the North Viking Graben, for example, along the length of the North Viking Graben, it's been stretched by about the same amount, about 15% of the original crust of extension. So it's take a bit of crust, 100 kilometers wide, stretch it by 15, 15%. It's not a lot. It takes about 300% to make a rift, or 300% to make an ocean. Um, but this is only a little bit, it's just 15%. But it, it gives us nice folds. And those continue along the length of it. But uh, let's have a look at the reason we can have these pictures, of course, is because of petroleum. And these are all seismically derived images. And here's a seismic section. It's got all sorts of petroleum geology handles on it here, um, which I won't go into, but it's just conveying uh, that there is actually an economic reason for acquiring data like this, but it's fantastic data for faults. Um, you can probably see the fault, I think, even with your own, uh, some of you, if you've never seen a fault before, oh, if you're looking at one. No, uh, did you ever see that? <laughs> There's, there's the fault there. Can you see the layers which are offset? And the left-hand side is downthrown. So you can imagine that we pull that crust and we land up with a fault and this side will drop down and this side goes up. You can actually see as you approach the fault, you see the way the beds roll over into the fault? Yeah? And it's very subtle, but this, uh, the upthrown side of this fault, you see the way the beds are going higher? Yeah, higher and higher. So this fault is like this, and the upthrown side is actually coming up into the air, and the downthrown side is rolling. There's deformation. When this fault moved, there's deformation of either side of the fault. What's interesting about this is that this is actually, see that upthrown there? There's actually a, a, a trap there, a gas trap. This is one of the largest gas fields in northwest Europe. And we can see the base of the gas. Do you see that line? Yeah, see that horizontal line? That's the gas water contact. I'm going to switch on the interpretation of the horizons. See this yellow horizon has been dropped down, the blue here, the red by less. And here's our gas water contact, and it's filling in the uplifted footwall, the uplifted upturn side. So these faults, they actually have an economic impact. They're generating traps. But you can also see the growth and see when they were active. Do you see this fault intersected? The surface in Upper Jurassic time, so about 150 million years ago when the stretching happened. And see the thickness of the sequence between the yellow and the red is much greater than it is between the yellow and red on the upthrown side, yeah? What that's reflecting is that if we take a fault and it offsets today's surface, yeah? And then we put sediment over the top, this side will be thicker than that side because the sediments were deposited during faulting. So imagine having a bit of a scarp developing here with this fault. You fill in more sediment here on that side than what you do on this side. It's telling us that here, for example, the fault had big displacements of the yellow horizon, but the red is only small displacements. That red horizon was only there for about that amount of displacement, not a lot. And the green is effectively not faulted at all. The green layer is post-dates the faulting. So we're getting a sense of when that fault developed, when that fault grew. Um, but it's sort of a bit quick. We don't have much sequence to work with. Uh, essentially, one of, the, one of the features of the North Sea is that the fault moves so rapidly that the sedimentation can't keep up. And you get a nice relief, lovely picture, a bit like, a bit like the East African Rift, but it's very hard to reconstruct how it got that way. This is a big fault with about a kilometer displacement, and it happened in about 10 to 15 million years. And that's as much as we can say. It's still a nice fault, though. And in context, if we look at this, we're going to look now at that yellow horizon, yeah? And we're going to look at it in a, a 3D surface. This is the yellow horizon now colored for red as high, blue as low, and up here red, and we're looking towards Norway, yeah? So we're actually in the middle of this North Viking Graben, this rift, yeah? And everything is dropped down into it. And you can see how it's been dropped down. Do you see the faults? Yeah, these scarps. These are big displacements. Some of these faults are in the kilometer scale displacements. There's been so much movement. These are just as big as the East African Rift. But it's all covered over by sediments. But seismic allows us to image these. We can image the subsurface and get a three-dimensional picture of them.
And these faults are lovely. You can see how, for example, this displacement, do you see the way it starts to decrease here? And yet, the displacement on this fault starts to increase in sympathy. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that this fault, when it dies out, the displacement is picked up on another fault. This is an interaction effect. These faults know each other's there, and they're transferring displacement between them. What's quite interesting about this particular section, which I think is about, about uh, 40 kilometers long, um, if we take a line through here perpendicular to the rift, and I m we measure the displacement, the stretching on that line, it's about the same as here. It's conserved. The amount of stretching along this basin is conserved, and yet the faults are really complicated. Look how complicated these faults are, but together they work together to produce a coherent system that looks really simple from a distance with the same drop and the same amount of displacement on the faults. And they're not all parallel. They're complicated. They start interacting. They start transferring displacement between each other. This one dying out. This here is dying out, and then this one's picking up. This is the way it works. This fault here splits into two faults. So it's a complicated system if you get very close, but if you stand back, it's actually accommodating the same amount of stretching of the crust. So it's really quite simple with all the faults working together. And this is just a few of the faults marked out. Now, how did they work and how did they grow? Years ago, about 30 years ago, um, we and others started trying to work out how faults grow. And what we did was, an, it's a very indirect way of working out how the growth happened. We're not measuring it directly. We're just measuring two properties of faults. So I showed you the Iceland fault, which for all the world looked like this single isolated fault. There isn't such a thing, but it looks like a single isolated fault. You get deformation either side as the fault dies out. And what, this, what we did was we measured the maximum displacement at the center of the fault and the length of the fault. Yeah? We did that in much the same way as you could do the same for people. You could measure their height and their width. Yeah? And when you measure the height and width of people, there's a lot of noise. But when you measure the height and width of people, you can actually see that uh, little things grow into big things. Um, when I was about that height at one time, hard to imagine. So um, these are growth laws. We end up with a trend. And that trend is oftentimes interpreted to be a growth trend. And, and here's with 4,000 faults on it, we're plotting uh, maximum displacement against length, and you can see that this, it looks like a trend. And, and the conventional wisdom, the conventional interpretation is, is faults, which are big displacement faults, which are very long, they must have been small displacement faults, which were very short. And uh, the small ones are growing to be bigger structures, aspiring to be the big thing. And not all of them make it, only some of them are big faults. This was a standard sort of model, and it is a standard model. It's called the isolated fault model, in which we, get, we stretch the crust, and we start off with lots of small faults within the crust, and those, crusts grow, those faults grow in length, and as they grow in length, they grow in displacement. They get bigger. And as we stretch them, they're more likely to get longer, and then they start to interact. So these are, they're all starting. They're not interacting yet. They're a growing displacement and length. And then they start to interact. You can see perhaps they might tr start transferring displacement. But this notion that the faults are isolated, they were sort of far enough away from other faults to almost grow in isolation is, is what actually underpins the isolated fault growth model. But that suggests that there's no interaction. And what I'm going to show you is that we actually think about fault growth in a different way now. There's not uh, potentially much time when the faults are really small and isolated that very quickly they actually start to interact with each other and they grow length quickly. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So just the idea they grow up here. And uh, in fact, earthquakes are down here. Earthquakes have, for the same length, an earthquake rupture will have a displacement which is very small compared to the fault. Now you can understand that, I think. 
a fault may have thousands of earthquakes on it. And they all add up to produce the big displacement in the center of a fault that has grown. But each earthquake rupture is actually quite a small displacement compared to its length. Yeah? And it's down here. So what happens here then is that this fault, or any fault, some putative fault, goes in displacement and it goes in length. And the size earthquake that we could have, for example, on a fault with, with let's say, 10 kilometers length, the size earthquake we could have is about 30 centimeters. Yeah? 30 centimeters earthquake, displacement, and a length of 10 kilometers. Whereas the total displacement of, of faults with a length of about 10 kilometers is much more like 30, much more like 30 meters. Or th sorry, 300 meters. This is a double um, uh, scale here. So it's more like a few hundred meters here for a 10 kilometers. So faults have big total displacements, but each earthquake rupture on them is going to be relatively small. But they add one on top of the other. So I'm going to take things a little bit further. That was indirect. What we were doing was measuring the displacements of faults, the maximum displacement and their length, and saying it was a growth trend. If we want to really work out how faults grow, then we want to go to areas where the fault grows up to the surface and then sediments progressively cover the fault scarp very quickly. Now, you, it might sort of not seem self-evident that if you cover the fault very quickly with sediments, you say, well, you can't see a thing. When those faults are growing, if you're covering them with sediments, it would, it would have been flat yeah, when the fault was growing. But seismic allows us to see through all that sediment and in the thicknesses of either side of the fault and the displacements on the fault, we can work out its growth. And I'm going to show you that there now. We're up here in the northwest shelf of Australia. We've got, these are the faults here. Again, the crust is an extension. And we're going to extend the crust and produce these normal faults. And here's the normal faults here. Very nice, beautiful seismic. And the amount of stretching is not a great deal. It's a few percent. So the crust is hardly extended at all. And the extension happened six million years ago, until present. These are the faults. And I think you can see, one of the key things you can see is that, perhaps, can you see, for example, that green to blue? I don't know if you, all of you can see green to blue. Some of you are green, red, colorblind, probably, actually. Or at least 5% of the audience, anyway. And um, let's say the blue to the red, yeah? See, it's very thin here, and then it thickens on the downtrown side, yeah? This fault was active when the blue to red was being deposited. But I also can work out how much displacement happened. Do you see the green has a big displacement because it's an old horizon? The blue has a lesser displacement because it's a younger horizon. The red is even younger again. It has less displacement. The yellow is much less. It's hardly moved. And the blue, light blue is a very young layer. And it's hardly moved at all. The amount that these layers have been moved records the history of the fault. It records its, its displacement history. And we can backtrack the whole thing so that can we, work out, we can work out how the displacement grew along that fault with time, how it lengthened, and how its displacement accumulated through time. And I'm going to show you some of that uh, here. Here's a map of the area. Before I do show you how we can backtrack and what we find out when we backtrack through time. Um, I'm going to just show you a basic map. This is of uh, the base. That green horizon is the base of the rifting. Six million years ago, that green horizon was here. And then the faults propagated up to the surface, and they start offsetting the green. The blue was deposited over the top and offset less and so on. I'm going to show you the green horizon over this map area. These are the faults. The tick is on the downthrown side in that case. Not that it really matters. But um, this is the map. Red is high, blue is low. And you can see the faults, not just because I've numbered them, though it does probably help. Uh, these are one, two, three, four, five for some reason. And um, you can probably see, I think very clearly, this one, number one, it sort of dies out here. The two starts dies out here, three, and so on. You can almost get a sense that the dying out, the lateral dying out of one, is not coincidence relative to that second fault there. And we can show that pretty well 
if we plot the vertical displacement along this train of faults, and we're going a long length here, it's up 12 kilometers, the total vertical displacement or throw is 100 meters on one. And then it's 100 meters, and then it drops off dramatically as it overlaps with two. And the displacement then transfers onto two, and then it continues with two, and then when two overlaps with three, the displacement is transferred over to three. These faults are transferring displacement between them. You're basically, they're interacting with each other. They sort of know each other's there. The deformation is reflecting the fact that both of them are there, and the displacement is basically going from one to the other. And you can see we get these ramps, which are deformations reflecting it. So those sorts of displacements are telling us that faults interact. And what we want to get a sense of is, is precisely how it is that they interact and what implications it has for earthquake things. But something like this, this is perfectly very coherent. All of these faults, they all combine to make something really uh, simple and, and sensible, even though, um, in a way, when you get close, it looks a little complicated. This is the aggregated displacement on all of those faults. It looks like roughly a constant displacement. So together, they're combining to produce something simple. But uh, they're basically interacting to produce something simple. Going to take these fault lengths, yeah? These faults and their displacements, you see these drop off rapidly, and there's like a flat top. When we plot, remember this maximum displacement against length, yeah? There's a whole cloud of data, red and green, yeah? Do you remember those trends? You know, as the max length increases, the maximum displacement increase. But now we've separated out in two different colors, faults, which have in red, they have rapid displacement changes at their ends. They're communicating with other faults. They're transferring displacement with other faults. And so they have these marked displacement uh, decreases at the ends. They're in red. The faults which don't, so the faults which aren't really showing strong interaction, do you see they nearly have linear profiles of displacement? They're not transferring displacement to anything. They look almost isolated. Faults down here are not interacting strongly. All of those up here are. They're transferring displacement. Now, the thing about this interaction is effectively we've looked at all the faults in this. 90% of this data set show faults are transferring displacement between each other. 90% of them show very clear evidence that they're interacting. They're not isolated. They're actually interacting structures. That interaction makes a big difference for earthquakes, as we see later. We can backtrack displacement. This is a fault growing with sediments being deposited progressively. So it's going through here, yellow being deposited. Then the fault offsets, then white is deposited. And we end up with, see the displacements are big at the bottom. And they decrease upwards because we get exactly the same in reality. And we can work out how those faults grow. I'm going to show you a weird plot. It's sort of a very odd plot when we got it eons ago, 20 years ago. We plotted displacement for each fault. One fault is one line. Yeah. Each fault, we plotted displacement against time. It's a six million year old rift, so time six million years ago is zero. And here we're at six million years in. One fault is one line. The depth of a fault is a circle, a solid circle. What's odd about this is that the maximum size fault, this isn't odd, but it's about 170 meters. But what's sort of odd is that a fault at the end of the six million years today, which has a displacement of 170 meters, is a bigger than average fault. But a half a million years in, it was also a bigger than average fault. In fact, a half a million years in, it was moving as fast as it is now. So within a half a million years, these faults are moving at the same rate that they've moved for the next five and a half million years. And they always knew it. That fault, these are small faults, and they're always moving slower. They're, they're just doomed to be slow moving. They're effectively in the shadow of a big fault. The big faults are getting all the action. And it's worse than that for small faults. This is the black dot. This is when they die. So these are small faults which move slowly, and they have high mortality rates. 
So small faults really do know their place. Yeah? They're effectively in the shadow, and it's the big faults which ultimately move faster, and they also outlive the smaller faults. This is not untypical for lots of natural systems. But the thing about this is, and what's weird about it, is that this fault should be going along this trend. And if it goes along this trend, when it was a little short fault, it was still moving quicker. This is the way that the maximum displacement, at the point of maximum displacement, the way the displacement increases. This fault was moving really quick, even when it was a short fault. So it's almost like it knew it was going to be moving this quick six million years from now, when it was short. Now that's not good. That sounds a bit dodgy to me. And we agonized over it. And then we realized that, in fact, maybe it wasn't as it appeared. If faults go along there, then that is always knows itself to be a fault, which is going to be big now. But maybe it isn't quite the same. We looked at fault length. And the fault length is established in the first period of time that we actually see these faults. This is only showing a million years. We now know in the first 500,000 years in this area, the fault length was just And immediately they started. Uh, they got their length, and then they accumulated displacement. Which faults moved faster? The long ones. Long faults can have big earthquakes on them. Yeah. Small faults can only have small earthquakes. So if I'm a long fault and I can have a big earthquake, I can grow fast by just having numerous big earthquakes. If I'm a small fault and I've got numerous small ones, it's hard to keep up. So small faults are small because they always were small. They always were short, and they often died early. This is basically the opposite of the isolated model. This is a model in which the faults achieve their length really quickly. They're overlapping and interacting with each other from the very outset. It's much more interesting and much more complicated and interactive than one where we can consider the faults to be isolated and gradually they grow to eventually interact. This is instantaneous. This is the way the faults grow. This is our trend in red. See the red points are the final displacements and lengths. This is the growth curves. They're vertical. The faults grow into the trend. They don't grow along it. They actually grow down here from earthquake dimensions, and they rapidly grow into this trend. And they get sucked into a logarithmic trend. This is a log log plot, which covers a multitude of sins. It's hard to get in it, and it's very hard to get out of it. So it's not a growth trend. It's actually just a zone. It's an area of strain and displacement length relationship here. This is our conventional thing. These earthquakes start off down here. This is the scaling of earthquakes. A fault achieves its length immediately, and then it grows into this trend. This happens within a half a percent of extension. The crust is extended by a half a percent, and these fault lengths are achieved immediately. Why? Well, in this case, there's a reason which we can offer. This is tertiary. This is down here below, uh, I think it's a Cretaceous um, uh, Jurassic uh, conformity. And in here, there's big displacements. Do you see that fault is a really big displacement? Yeah? Compared to up here, but smaller, really big displacement. That's pre that unconformity. These faults were active underneath. They were active in upper Jurassic times in this northwest shelf. They're underneath, ready for action. Six million years ago, the crust stretches, and these faults propagate rapidly upwards, and they take over where they started off. They had become long faults underneath in this earlier Jurassic phase of rifting, and they just inherited their lengths by propagation straight through this tertiary cover sequence. Yeah? So they, growed long, they grew really long because they were underneath the surface ready there and primed. It's inheritance. This is reactivation of faults. The faults were there beforehand. But it's not just that. Um, I'm, I'm just going to show you this. This is give you a sense of how much depth there is in, in fault growth. Um, here's a, a lower horizon here. This is a, an old horizon. It has all the faults that ever lived in this system. This is a second older horizon. It has only those faults that lived into that horizon age. And there are fewer of them. 
And here, this is one the youngest horizon, and there are only the big faults are really well represented on that. So what happens is we stretch, we get lots of faults, they're all interacting, but gradually we end up localizing onto fewer and fewer faults. That's what the system wants to do. It's energetically more favorable. But we end up with a population of faults, lots of faults to get to that. And if you, some of you may be familiar that we, we've got a, if we plot the population of earthquakes, the number of earthquakes against the magnitude of earthquakes, we get straight lines on these log log graphs. There are lots of small earthquakes. Faults are the same. But then that's not a surprise, because all earthquakes happen on faults. So there's a population of faults. There's lots of them all interacting. And this is a sandbox model. There's no pre-existing faults here. And yet, in that sandbox model, they grow in the same way. We've had to correct for scaling, because it is sand, and for the material properties. But this is, you can see that the fault growth is basically, they faults achieve their length, and they accumulate displacement with very little propagation. Um, they have drop-offs and displacements here. They're interacting and transferring displacement to another fault. It's very rapid. It's very interactive. And the more interactive it is, the more complex it's likely to be. I mean, in the end, it's still sucked into this trend, but it's not a growth trend. So this is a different look of a model. This is a model in which defaults achieve their length very quickly. They accumulate displacement progressively and there are, is some linkage between these as we get high strains between these faults which are really close, the faults might link or will link. But ultimately, this is, this is a really interactive system, much more than the so-called isolated fault model, which, of course, as I said, faults like that don't really exist, do they? They did about 30 years ago. This, you can see this. This is a, this is a map from uh, bring us back to Ireland here. It's the only bit of Ireland you see, apart from me. Uh, Porcupine Basin, offshore Ireland, and you can see that these faults are transferring displacement one to the other. It's a highly interactive system. It's a really interesting system. And as with any interactive system, it can get complicated. Now, normally when we get to earthquakes, and I'm going to start getting earthquakey, um, and normally when we get to earthquakes, we actually start thinking about stress. And we start thinking of when we have an earthquake, there's a stress developed. This is a, a diagram from an earthquake in uh, Mexico, and the fault is here. And this here, they're modeling the stress distribution after an earthquake happened. So the idea is that there's a buildup of stress, an earthquake happens, and you relieve the stress. So you get this blue area where the fault is. But at the end, you get high stresses. Those high stresses at the end of that fault are more likely to trigger another fault close to those high stresses to move. So you can imagine that stress is actually a way for faults to communicate with each other. There's a deformation, and that transfers displacement. Now, of course, in the end, it ends up being a permanent deformation, but stress, it, well, it always gets to you. And it is a way of actually sort of transferring from one to another fault. But you accumulate that over time, and you've got a fault system which is interactive, behaves nicely, but it's complicated. And I'm going to get to that now. Um, this is a plot of cumulative displacement against time, and we're getting earthquakey here. If we have a fault which has the same sized earthquakes, which are these steps, and the same time between these earthquakes, it'll look like a staircase. Imagine a fault in isolation. I can imagine it. If it moves, it's going boom. There's a regular time between the big earthquakes. It's regular. It's characteristic. This is a model called characteristic earthquakes. Characteristic earthquake model in extremis is one where you get big earthquakes, and they're regular in time. They have a repeat time. This is really quite nice and predictable. If the world, if you wanted to predict when the next earthquake was happening, that would be trivial. But let's say they have. Uh, a change in slip, different slip for each earthquake, but the same time. There's the same time period, but different slips. It gets a little bit more complicated. If we have different times, but the same earthquake size, it also gets a little bit more complicated. It's not, re it's not regular, it's irregular. Sometimes the fault is hardly moving, and sometimes it's moving fast. If both the slip during an earthquake and the timing is variable, you get a complicated, uh, unpredictable 
uh, progression of earthquakes. And I'm going to suggest that that might be much more common than we think, this unpredictable, when we get to very short time scales. And I, I'm going to uh, dip into a couple of examples. Here's the, um, this is the Hikurangi Trough, in which the oceanic crust is subducting underneath North Island. I'm going to go south in a little bit. This is North Island, where the subduction zone is going underneath. So here's North Island. Subduction zone is going underneath. But the subduction zone and the oceanic slab starts to drop, starts to roll back. As it rolls back, the, the continental crust has to stretch. So imagine that. Actually, you have the oceanic crust here. And then it starts dropping back. Then above it, we have to stretch the crust. So here's the rollback, and the crust has to stretch. We get these little rifts, Taupo Rift, beautiful tourist area. Lots of bungees and skydiving. Fantastic volcanics. Uh, Taranaki Basin, bit offshore, a bit wet, but nice volcano there. These are lovely rifts. So we're still ta talking about extension, and I'm going to get into the middle of Taupo Rift now. This is the Taupo Rift, 15 kilometers across. Um, it's one to two million years. It's uh, about one centimeter a year. It's extending at about one centimeter a year across it. And uh, the maximum earthquake is about nearly seven. Uh, here's one earthquake, which is six and a half. The uh, Edgecombe earthquake, a uh, lovely scarp developed, normal fault. So, we're going to get into the middle of this area. The fantastic thing about this area is there's lots of volcanic tufts, lots of tephra. So there's so much volcanism that when a scarp develops, the volcanics cover up the scarp. They preserve the displacement history. In exactly the same way as our seismic data shows, this is like an on-land equivalent. Loads of volcanics going over the top. Um, it doesn't look very promising when you look at the terrain. It looks a bit like Ireland. Very green, but not very geological, but it's really subtle. Do you see that? That's a fault. Yeah. It's a little roll. Get the sunlight right. It's a little roll. Um, you can see there's actually a big fault here, which is dying out here. Yeah. There's another fault here and so on. I'm going to show them. These are lovely faults. Let's go back. Whoa, look at that. Not bad, eh? These are really subtle. And you can, you can map them from digital elevation models. And we can actually then trench them. We can cut trenches across them. I'm going to show you that we've done that. We've produced a map, a fault map. There are different layers of different ages. Fluvial deposits are between 0 and 20,000 years. Lacustrine deposits in pink are between 20 and 60,000 years. But we can date all of those locally. And earthquake flat is a 60,000-year surface. And uh, then the rhyolite volcanics are up to a quarter of a million. So we've got really good data on the long time scale, but it's even better on the short. This is a not very promising looking trench. Um, it just looks like a whole lot of brown stuff. But in the hands of the right expert, I mean, even I began to recognize the different tufts. Um, here's the trench. And you can dig them in. The farmers are very accommodating because earthquakes are important in these areas. And it's very easy to cut through them too. And I'm now going to show you the interpretation of this, which is here. Here are the layers, one to six. Here's the fault. And you can see, can you see that layer two is offset more than layer six? Yeah? It's got more of a displacement. Layer two is older, and it contains more of the displacement history than layer six. And as we go up through the younger layers, they have less and less displacement. And that's, that's reflecting the accumulation of displacement on these faults. And they can also do other things. They can look at things like a, a plant material. And you, sometimes you end up in an earthquake, you have a little bit of a scarp. And you can end up with detritus deposited within it. You can get all sorts of ways of direct, uh, identifying earthquakes. The really nice thing is that it's 1.75 thousand years, 5.6, 9, 13, 15. This is fantastic resolution data. That 1.75, for example, was such a huge volcanic eruption that even the Romans noticed it in the red sky at night. So it wasn't quite munch-like, but that was another volcano. Uh, but this was a good one, uh, Taupo Volcanics. At the same time, well, there was nobody living here, of course. This is a, the vertical displacement against age. 
And in this trench, it's a really well-behaved trench. And you can see, I think, that it's, it's actually quite well-behaved with very little jumps. There's a little bump here, but it's much better behaved than most of the trenches we see. What's really nice is that this is back, so this is today, going back in time to 20,000 years, there's this really nice trend. But this is the 60,000 year displacement. You see that the gradient here is lower than the gradient overall, yeah? See, this is steeper here than that. What's that saying? What that is saying is that in the last 25,000 years, this fault has been moving relatively slowly. Yeah, but enough for us to see it. But over 60,000 years, it was moving much quicker. Yeah, so it's actually, it's, short, it's slowed down a bit. That's just one. We can look at lots of slip profiles, and they're all um, different, and they're sometimes incredibly variable and complicated. This fault stopped moving for 10,000 years for some reason, and then it moved, and with a big earthquake and then a couple of small ones there. This here was dead for, again, about 15,000 years, up the same 15,000 years, and then it had a couple of earthquakes. It's, it's a great deal more complicated than you'd like to think. It's not systematic. But you know, when you look far enough away from it, we're looking very close. When you get far enough away from this, these systems, they start to look a little bit more sim simple and straightforward. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Here's these profiles. This is one, a few of these profiles. Just to give you an idea. This fault here in orange has moved in the last 2,000 years by two meters, but it didn't move in the previous 12,000 years by more than about 20 centimeters. This is much the same, actually. This fault here for 22,000 years was very slow moving, but about 22,000 years ago to 20. 7,000 years ago, it was going, as we say in Ireland, it was going like the clappers. Yeah? It bombed along. How would you know that a fault, which is behaving, it seems really quite sensibly, and that all of a sudden, 20 to 25,000 years ago, it was really flying along. This is complicated, um, but it's interesting. But what we can do is we can do things like we have a few trenches there on a few little faults, and those few little faults, we can take their displacements, and we can add them together, and they look simpler. So for example, this fault is moving. One of these faults, and the three of them are right beside each other, back to back. One of them is moving fast, while this is moving slow. They're compensating for each other. One of them takes a bit of the displacement, and, and it's moving faster, while another one is slowing down. And, and, and this is a complicated uh, process, but nevertheless, from a distance, it looks a lot simpler. And this is a feature that we see. If we actually look from a distance spatially, all these systems look simpler. When you get closer, of course, they get more complicated. This is a measure of how, when you get back in time, now not in space, but in time, here we are. This is looking at the 18,000 year displacements against the 60,000 years displacement for about 20 faults. It's very correlated. Faults which are moving very quickly in the 18,000 year surface uh, in that time frame, they were also moving very quickly um, over the 60,000 years surface. So once we get to about 18,000, it looks like this system, it's, it's coming out in the wash. It's becoming sensible. It's not really uh, very irregular. It's all sort of showing something systematic. Faults are going at a rate which is fairly sort of steady. But 18,000 years, you've heard, have you heard this term of the repeat time for earthquakes? Repeat time is this, we have a big earthquake and it happens and it repeats, let's say, every couple of thousand years. People talk about the repeat time for this system as being about 2,000 years. But it takes about 15 to 20,000 years before this makes sense of itself. It takes about five repeat times at least for this system to become systematic. It's very chaotic below this so-called level. So, you know, at, at a notional repeat time, this is a really complicated system. When you get far, and this you could almost use a ruler to measure this, this is the displacement against time for all the faults along, across the rift in our trenches. And they represent about 40% of the total. And you can see 
the displacement through time, you can put a line on it. If I average all the displacements on all faults across the rift, it's perfectly behaved. So on this big scale of a rift, it's perfectly behaved. On big time scales, it's perfectly behaved. The problem is, with earthquakes, we have to get close, and we have to get short time scale, and that's when it gets complicated. Yeah? But geologically, it's a lot more simple, which is good, because we're simple people, uh, most geologists anyway. I'm going to get a, go over to another area, Taranaki Rift here, which is another stretching basin. I'll quickly go through that, but there are a couple of learnings we get. These are all basins. These are two basins, which are not headline basins. They don't have big earthquakes. They're not straining. But we can work out how the fault grows. It's really quite useful. Um, this here is there's a volcano here. And uh, don't worry about the volcano. It hasn't an effect on the, on the fault movement. And these are the faults, and they go into here into the Taranaki Rift. I'm going to show you the data we have. We've got lots of trenches here shown in rectangles. We've got a, a fault a coastal cliffs, which are beautiful coastal cliffs, which show the set. And these are sediments deposited during faulting. So we're in business. Lots of sediment coming in. Um, and not too many fault scarps to find. Seismic reflection data. This is the most prospective basin in hydrocarbon terms. In, in New Zealand. So they've required seismic on shore. So we get it really big scale. So I'm going to talk you through that. Here's our, do you see a little, little dip here? That's the fault. Get an expert now, very subtle. And we can get the digger, you know what they are. And you can dig through this because it's all volcanic stuff. It's very easy. Um, very familiar picture, brown, nondescript, but fantastically um, well defined by the experts in terms of the stratigraphy. And uh, we can work out how it grew. And I'll show you in a second. I'm going to show you coastal exposures. There's a beautiful coastal exposure here. I'm going to put the interpretive horizons on because it's helpful. This yellow uppermost horizon is offset by that amount. Very little. The youngest horizon is offset very little. The older horizons, like the pink, have really large offsets. Yeah? This, is a f this fault was moving when the sediments were being deposited. So we've got very big displacements on the pink, very big displacements on the green, and they decrease progressively upwards because young horizons have less displacement because they were there for less of the time. We can work out how they grew, and I'll show you now in a second. We can also get the seismic. Here's a seismic line. Um, well, you, even, even with the seismic line, you can actually see uh, faults through those. Very nice. You can interpret them. This fault system has been active for 3.7 million years. Let me just show you a fault here. Look at fault three. See the yellow is thickened across the fault. This is the time that this fault started moving in yellow times. Greater thickness, greater thickness in this white, greater thickness, and the fault extends up the surface. All of these arrows are the faults that we actually have identified and trenched. We haven't trenched any other faults because these, these were the only ones we could see. But we can now see their long-term growth. And when we put it all together, we get earthquakes on the trench scale. On the coastal exposure, it's a little bit longer. It, this is quite a well-behaved one, um, but I'll show you a couple of ones that aren't. Um, these are where we think maybe the earthquakes in that period occurred. And this is the long-term. For one of these faults, it's beautiful. Again, you can nearly put a line on it. When you get to 3.7 million year time scales and you start looking at the growth of the fault, it's really simple. It's very well behaved. Um, what's interesting about this is, do you see that has a low step there? 3.7 million years ago, the fault was going a bit slower. All the faults were going a bit slower in this system. Then they got a bit of a kick from the subduction zone. They started moving at the same rate, all of them. So we can work out. That on geological time scales, it's simple. On uh, paleo seismological scales, it's, it's much more complicated. And this is sort of illustrating that. Look at the yellow, big kick. Um, this brown, blue, or black is, is sort of irregular. But oddly enough, if we take the short term displacements and plot them against the long term displacements, because we can do that for all these faults, this is the short term Holocene displacements, 10,000 years. This is the 3 million years. All of these faults are distinguished by their moving really quickly in the last 10,000 years. The faults that we're measuring are biased 
we're more likely to identify the ones that happen to be fast moving just at the moment. Yeah, that stands to reason. You get a little bit of a scarp. It's completely biased. For all of these faults, there are loads of them who ha aren't moving much in the last 10,000 years. And we didn't identify them because they don't produce a little surface effect. And there's loads of them. I'm going to show you them now. These are the faults we identified. All of these faults are in seismic, the green ones. And we never identify them because they, they happen not to be been active in the last 10,000 years much. It's all an artifact. It's all sampling. And it's all because some faults, they have their time for a short period. They're bombing along. And sometimes they go a bit quiet. And another fault moves. These are all the faults we have. In fact, 1994, that's as many as we knew in this area in Taranaki Rift. Uh, it's a bit different in 2011. The closer you look, the more faults there are. And it reminds me of the old thing that uh, I used, somebody said to me, well, you know, are there lots of faults? And I said, well, all you have to do is go to a nuclear power station and you'll find a fault. Because it seems that every nuclear power station has a fault. And of course, the reason is, is because when you have put in a nuclear power station, you have to look at the geology and you'll always find a fault. Britain and Ireland, they happen to be dead. Here they're active. So I'm going to take it a little bit further. Long time scale coherence, <coughs> short time scale complexity. And we're now going to go down very quickly to Canterbury, where the earthquakes recently happened, and uh, to Kaikoura. Oh, this is all driven here by the subduction here. And then we end up with, do you see the movement vectors here? They're nearly parallel to the plate boundary here. So the top is going to the right, and the bottom is going to the left. It's a strike-slip system. Yeah? There's sh lateral movement along this boundary here. There's the Alpine fault, but up here there's a clatter, loads of faults, really quite interesting. Down here it's one fault, a bit boring. I mean, the North Anatolian fault is very interesting. It's actually well behaved, but then that's it. That's what it is. There's just a few segments. This is much more interesting. There's a whole population there, and it gets a little bit more complicated as a consequence. Anyway, this is the map from 2002 of all the active faults. This is the map from 2010 of all the active faults. It's not that they all started, it's just that we're looking closer and we're mapping it better. And this is an area where they, well, it probably shouldn't have happened. This is the Christchurch, uh, this is the Canterbury earthquake, the Christchurch earthquake, very large earthquakes that had a huge effect. Um, this, the Christchurch earthquake, happened on a fault that we didn't even know existed. And I'll tell you the reason for that in a second. But these, this caused a lot of damage um, at a loss of life, although for the scale of the earthquake, it was really quite remarkable that um, uh, the uh, fatalities didn't run potentially into thousands. It does help that all the houses are wooden. And it does help that actually a lot of the earthquake moment, moment and movement was actually dampened by liquefaction, by the sand shaking. The liquefaction happened and sand actually extruded out its surface. But it did mean that you know, houses were um, damaged, 20 billion uh, euro of damage. Um, but fewer people died. And 115 of the 185 people uh, died in that building in the Canberra, or in the Canterbury uh, TV station. And um, it, it was because that building, which was built in 1988, was not up to standard. They actually tried to save on the thickness of the walls and the construction. Uh, it wasn't earthquake resistant. It was far from it. And uh, so if you have proper building, you can mitigate the risk. Uh, if you don't, then you end up with a problem like this. And of course, there was lots of flooding and so on. Why did we not know it was there? The reason is the Alps. The Alps are huge mountains feeding in sediment into the Canterbury Plains. There's so much sediment coming in that if ever we developed a fault scarp, it's covered over really quickly. Yeah? If the sedimentation rate is too rapid, any fault is going to be covered over. It'll appear not to exist. And the only way to find it is with seismic. So you need seismic data. So this fault was never known. And you can see, see onshore, you see very few faults. It's high sedimentation rate. When you get offshore and it's a little bit lower sedimentation rate, you see lots of active faults. And it's not stopping just at the bay. It's all down to sedimentation rate. There are lots of faults which are actually only discovered because they have a big earthquake on them. In an area with only a historical record of 150 years, 
And with sedimentation rates this high, it's not surprising you don't see everything. But they will reveal themselves with earthquakes. I'm going to go up to Kaikoura, which is literally on uh, the boundary. The subduction zone is dying out here, and we end up on the uh, strike slip boundary. I'll just quickly show you how complicated. This is one of the most complicated earthquake ruptures, um, certainly in the last, uh, well, I suppose, in detailed studies over the last few decades. Um, you'll see, see all these reds are, are pre existing faults. These are all faults that are there, primed, ready for action. And yet, the rupture happened on these green, in this green area. Very complicated rupture pattern. There are so many faults that the displacement actually ruptured here at the end, where the displacement is low. The rupture began here in this uh, Humps Fault Zone. And then it propagated, transferred partly to the Hope Fault, and then back again onto the Hundley Fault, then back onto the Jordan Fault, then onto the... Very complicated. But it got there. 170 kilometers of earthquake rupture with a maximum displacement of 10 meters and starting really at the low point on the left. But very complicated. What's really odd is that the Hope Fault, which is far and away the fastest moving fault in this area, hardly moved at all in this earthquake. It's basically moving on smaller structures temporarily. Of course, it'll move on the Hope Fault in time. We know over time it's a very fast moving fault. Um, these are the displacements. It doesn't matter, about 10 meters here down to zero in the left. And, and here's the hump uh, backs fault zone here. You see, see the little kink in the, in, the, in the road? That's because it's just been repaired. But you can see the fault scarp here. It's about two meters displacement here. There's a fault scarp, and it used to go across the fault. Here's the uh, leader uh, fault, and a uh, really nice fault. Um, a pity about the scale, which is me. And um, beautiful fault. Yeah? It's like a white wall. And it's an uh, oblique slip, but it actually traps a little lake behind it going across. And that's in this area here. What's really odd about this is that the pre existing active faults are in red, but the faults that moved are in blue. Some of them weren't even identified before. And not all the red faults, the active faults, have moved. There's an awful lot of redundancy here. There's lots of faults ready to move, and only some of them happen to move in this particular earthquake. But others will happen to move in the next one, or the next earthquake. And, and the Hope Fault will, in time, become the fastest moving fault over time average. But it just happened not to move in this. So we're talking about blasts of activity, lots of activity, and it gradually tails. It's migrating. Not one fault, but lots of faults. And here's the movement. This is the uplift, eight meters from this INSAR radar data. Um, and so all of these are pre-existing faults. There's a lot of faults within the wake and associated with this. In this case, liquefaction was, in, in Christchurch, important. Here, landslides are very important. You can see they're localized close to the fault. So in terms of mitigating risk, landslides, liquefaction, infrastructure, and buildings, of course, this is historical data for earthquakes. There's our last few. Maybe there's an association down in Christchurch. It's migrated to Kaikoura. Maybe the next is, is Wellington. There was a blast in 1930s up in this area where we had a number of really large earthquakes. Which earthquake is going to move? Which fault? We don't know. But there might be blasts of activity on multiple faults which are migrating northwards here, perhaps towards Wellington. And I'm going to show you. And it, so it's a little bit more complicated version of this stress thing. It's hard to do these stresses in isolation. These stress computations, they assume that there's a clean slate. Okay, you wipe it all clean, then you have an earthquake. And they don't assume it, but they're easier to interpret if you assume a clean slate. But a bit like at home, I mean, there's no such thing as a clean slate. <coughs> yeah. So. We're about to finish now. These are our faults. This is the number of faults offshore. Between the faults that were active here and Wellington here, lots of faults. Is it dangerous for the likes of Wellington? Well, of course it is. I mean, Wellington had one of its biggest earthquakes associated with it was in 1850. It wasn't on the Wellington fault here. It was actually on the Wairapa fault here, which is, well, whatever, 25 kilometers away. These big earthquakes happening on big faults have big effects spatially. So we perhaps don't 
have to worry quite as much about precisely what fault moves, although it does make a difference if we have really big earthquakes and they move on a fault which is only 25 kilometers away, then you have big effects. Like Wellington went up in that earthquake in 1850. The landing slip for, strip for the uh, airport it was it emerged out of the sea in that time. But if the Wellington fault moves, it will go down. And that's not good. Anything going up is fine. Going down isn't. So I'm going to finish off. The numbers of active faults is increasing. Risk mitigation. I've, I've talked about a lot of complexity. The best way to deal with earthquakes is to mitigate the risk associated with them. Don't allow people to build houses beside mountains with landslides. Liquefaction. Avoid uh, sands and so on. And uh, This is basically just a summary. Things on long time scales, very simple it seems, but progressively shorter, much more complicated. But we're certainly learning about these. Earthquake prediction is not possible, but risking earthquake activity on fault systems as they migrate through multiple faults uh, might be. But there's only a 150 year backdrop here, so it's more difficult. Risk medication is the best way. That's me. Thanks. Sorry about that. I went about 10 minutes over, but this is the second time I'm giving this talk. So believe it or not, that was slower. <laughs> so the other one was much quicker. A few questions? Yes, of course. Right. Yeah. Questions from the floor. Microphone is coming to you. Here it comes. Lovely. Uh, according to your model, um, the, the, the faults kind of, they grow almost in, laterally, almost instantaneously. What's the, con what are the controls on that? Um, is it lithology? Because obviously uh, with the long faults, they're going across a very long distance. They're cutting across multiple yeah. rock types. Yeah. The odd thing is that if you go back to theoretical considerations, you would actually predict faults will grow very rapidly. Okay. And from the observational work, we convinced ourselves that they didn't. Mm -hmm. So in fact, it is more theoretically sound to say that faults grow more rapidly to the point where they interact. Okay. And it, it, that's actually just fracture mechanics. Mm -hmm. We haven't written that up, but it's true. It's, it's actually, we, we spent our time convincing ourselves there were trends there, and there you go. Um, everybody subscribed to it, I think, apart from those that probably didn't, and they just nicely didn't uh, uh, criticize us for it. So we came around with that way of thinking. Um, getting back to the rock type thing, I mean, these are faults which sometimes, uh, not in New Zealand, they go down to about seven to eight kilometers in New Zealand. It's quite narrow, uh, uh, thin crust. But a lot of faults go down 10, 15 kilometers. And if you think about the rocks just near the surface, are they really controlling whether a fault will move or not? I'm not so sure. I think that faults respond. Of course, there are irregularities which might localize a rupture. But the actual displacements overall may have more to do with the crustal properties rather than the local ones, uh, although that would probably be controversial to those who spend a lot of time looking at the local. Uh, yeah. With that in mind, um, is uh, faults, do faults tend to grow from beneath, um, from a certain part of the crust, if they're inherited through the crust? Yeah, very, very good question. Um, we've got a paper which is coming out this year in which we think we've been able to look at rupture propagations. Now, that's not to say that the fault didn't exist, but the ruptures are actually, and they're propagating from deep upwards, which I suppose makes a bit of sense, because it's hard for them to propagate from the air downwards. But on the average, it's from, and I suspect there's also a time lag too. I think that if faults go into shear zones at depth, it's more likely that the brittle structures are actually behind the the ductile ones, so they're always in front. And the frictional resistance is basically means that a lot of this stuff is propagating up. And lots of them don't get up to the surface. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Add. Who's next? It's, um, it's clear that you use, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of seismic survey data in your work. Yes. It's quite probable that oil companies won't be using much seismic data in the near future. Um, would that be a problem for you? If, could you have another source of seismic data and when the oil companies don't provide it? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, to be honest, I mean, when you look at the amount of money involved, 20 billion 
euro for the damage associated with the likes of the Christchurch earthquake and stuff, they're, then they're very good grounds for a national initiatives to acquire seismic, uh, rather than oil companies coming in and do the job for us. Um, now, of course, it wouldn't be the case in Ireland and Britain, you know, which is um, inactive, relatively speaking. Um, but there's so much seismic data there, and it's brilliant size. I mean, when you think of the the millions that have been spent to acquire this seismic data, and we're using it to learn about faults, fundamental aspects of faults. But faults happen to be both economically important and fundamentally interesting. So we happen to be using the seismic data, and we'll have plenty of this. Plenty. I saw a data set yesterday. A person gave a talk, and it was just fantastic. The data was to to die for. It was just fantastic. <laughs> it was brilliant. And you sort of think, God, if we just lived off the data sets that companies have been inquiring for one purpose, which is to find oil and gas, then we can find a hell of a lot of scientific stuff on the back of it. But yeah, you're right. I mean, gradually that's going to, um, inevitably, it's going to uh, uh, fall off. But I, I think until We'll be learning more about earthquakes and perhaps water could kick in, mineral deposits and, and so on. So there's hopefully there to be an awful lot to keep us going. Yeah. Let's oh. do one more. Do um, thrust faults propagate in the same way, sort of cutting out? And very good. Yeah, very good question. Um, yeah, the th we think they do. And I think that 